Good evening and welcome to our Bible study. We send you greetings from Wake Forest, North Carolina, from Good Greater evening Works and welcome to Community Fellowship our Church of Bible God study. in Christ. We apologize for the technical difficulty of those glitches, but we're working them out. Praise God. I am Missionary Tammy Johnson Blunt, your teacher for this evening. We give honor to God. We give honor to our Pastor Gordon McKinney, our First Lady Baronina McKinney, my husband, Deacon Dennis Blunt, all the greater work, Church of God and Christ family. We thank God for each and every one of you who joins us week after week for our Bible study. Studies, we praise God that your hearts and minds are attuned. We thank God once again for you joining us. We are located at 1428 Wall Road in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Let us open with a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to come before you on this evening, oh God, but thank you and praising you, oh God, for this Bible study lesson, oh God, but thank you and praising you for our pastor who has brought us up to this far, oh God, with these lessons, oh God, we're thanking you for each and every one who has joined us, oh God, via social media, oh God, touch their hearts, their minds, oh God, so that they would want to go higher and deeper in you, oh God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And again, once again, we thank you for joining us. Praise God for you. We thank God for the Bible study that we have been learning about the parables. So tonight we are on the parables number seven and number eight. And these are in chronological order. So the parable number seven is found in Luke, the 12th chapter, the 15th through the 21st verses. And that is the rich fool. Then parable number eight. That is found in Luke 12, chapter 12, the 35th through the 40th verses, and that is regarding watchfulness. And as we read from the New International Version, the NIV, parable number seven, Luke, the 12th chapter, starting at the 15th verse, going to the 21st, it reads, then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself. But is not rich, excuse me. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. And that was parable number seven found in Luke, the 12th chapter, the 15th through the 21st verses. And then we go to parable number seven. I'm going to read from Luke, the 12th chapter, the 35th through the 40th verses. This is regarding watchfulness. 35th verse reads, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You must also be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now we're going to go into some questions regarding these verses that we have read. 
Now, the first question says in verse 15, Jesus said, beware. Now, is that a strong warning or simply a caution? So now in old Bible translations, they use the words take heed and the NIV and the Holman versions have watch out, which seems like a caution. But beware is probably the best translation of the original Greek, and it is an intensive term because it is inherently empathetic. It is rarely followed by an explanation mark. We would not expect to see a sign, beware of wet paint, or beware new grass planted, because the word is too strong for the occasion. But it is more likely to be used in a sign like beware vicious dog or beware bridge out. Thus, when Jesus used the word beware, he was indicating great danger. In other places, the word beware is found in Matthew 7, 15. It says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, and but inwardly are ravaging wolves. And also in Luke 12th chapter, first verse, first verse, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So that word beware, it is a word that we should not take lightly. Now, verse, um, the second question, it says, how does greed show up in a person's life? And do, do you see this in your life? It says, Jesus' strong warning here is about greed. He says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He is explaining that the essential, fundamental evil and error of covetousness, that is being eagerly desirous of wealth of possessions, is that covetousness makes one think that life is comprised and composed of the things he possesses. And don't we often feel that way? Times we want more. We're not satisfied with what we have. We just feel that those material goods that we have to obtain them. So it says if we have material goods, we'd be better off or just even better than those who do not have them. So this is what the Lord was attacking when he asked the rhetorical question in the Sermon on the Mount. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? So our life's value, our soul's worth is not measured by what we own. The scripture says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That's in Mark 8.36. Jesus would never have asked those questions if the covetousness theme were true. That is, your life is measured by what you possess. It is not what you own. It is what owns you that really matters. And after posing the warning about greed in straightforward language, Jesus goes on to tell a parable about it. Often he only tells the parable, but in this case, he's waving a red danger flag first. He gave the warning. And the third question asks, is it wrong or a bad thing to be rich? If not, what's the big problem? The answer is absolutely not. We look at Abraham, Jacob, Solomon, and Job. It says they were not simply rich but they were very rich. The rich man in this parable is not criticized or condemned because he was wealthy. Wealth itself does not damn anyone. Conversely, poverty does not save anyone. Wealth is not a vice. Poverty is not a virtue. It may be hard to believe, but many people with no money will go to hell over the riches they so strongly desire. At least that's what Paul writes to Timothy. He states, but people who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap 
and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge them into ruin and destruction. Now that's found in 1 Timothy 6 and 9. So it is not riches, but the trust in riches that dooms men, as stated in Mark, the 10th chapter, the 23rd through the 35th verses. Now it is this trust, this belief in material substance that condemned the rich man. Five times he used the personal pronoun, my. He referred to my crops, my bonds, my grain, my goods, myself. Now that's not evil either, for there is a sense in which things do belong to us. We own them. But however, in this case, it was the absorbing, the consuming thought of his life. And that is wrong. Even building the bonds wasn't wrong. He actually acted wisely in building larger bonds for his surplus so it would not rot or be eaten by scavenger animals. But he acted foolishly in allowing his goods to secure, as he thought he did, his soul. So now the early translation saying, I will say to my soul, whereas the later translations say, I will say to myself. In this case, I would say the early translation is probably the best one. The man imagined many years of ease and security, many years in which he could take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But how does the rest of that phrase go? says, for tomorrow we die. But now the rich man did not consider death. He stopped with Mary. He forgot for tomorrow we die. But in his case, even if he had said it, he would have been in error. It was not tomorrow. But in this case, the very night, his life or his soul would be demanded of him. So now the fourth question asked, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon spoke of two items in this story. How does Ecclesiastes 5.15 fit in? And later in Ecclesiastes 8.15, Solomon says, so I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry. And this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. Is the Bible giving us conflicting advice? So now Ecclesiastes 5.15 reads, We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. Now, that's the new literary translation. So neither the devil nor this world can give you one single item that will not be snatched and taken away from you the moment you die. We all go into bankruptcy at death. We leave it all. We cannot take anything with us. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon then wondered whether his riches might not go to a fool who would throw it all away. Even earlier, David said this same thing in Psalm 39 and 6. It says, surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. And then in, again in Psalms 49 and 10, states even wise men die, the stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. But the rich man did not foresee this eventuality. He was oblivious to eternity. David said it in Psalms 49, 6 through 9, and Jesus said it here, your wealth will not do you one jot of good when you die. The only thing that counts is being rich toward God. 
the big difference between this parable and what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 8.15, eat, drink, and be merry, is that he is saying it gratefully in thanks that God has given him wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them. A few verses later, he adds that one should be joyful that God favors what you do. He is not saying it arrogantly or pridefully, as the rich man in the parable is. So now question number five. Does this parable say that you should not plan for retirement or that you should not save money or value? In one sentence, what does being rich toward God actually mean? Well, the answer to that is absolutely not. Saving money and planning ahead are good things. The Bible in many places stresses using one's money and gifts wisely. Other parables actually advise us to increase our wealth, to be good caretakers of what God has entrusted to us, and to help the poor and those less fortunate. This is often spoken about the orphans and the widows. This is how we show we are rich toward God. This is to the antidote of covetousness. It is the man who has his priorities in order, who sees to the wealth and prosperity of his soul. Paul says it again to Timothy, says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. And that's found in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, the 17th verse. And I read that from the New Literary Translation. So now a personal question is, with what parts of the parable can you identify? What do we identify with? What parts of the parable make us feel uncomfortable? So that's something that, again, is personal. As we read the parable, how does it affect us? How does it cause us to reflect? Are we giving to the poor? Are we identifying with the rich man? Are we able to help others? Are we just trying to gather everything for ourselves? That me, myself, and I complex, all that I have. Are we grateful to God for what we have? Or are we trying to hoard it for ourselves? Again, we can't take it with us. So that is a personal question. So the seventh question is, why is it difficult for us to accept the fact that our life and things are temporary. And what steps can we take this week to become less dependent upon our possessions? Again, that's a thought-provoking question. So we say we work so hard to acquire the things that we have. We want to enjoy life to the fullest. Yes, God gave us life to enjoy it. He gave us those things to enjoy, but not again to hoard, not to look down on anybody because they don't have, to think we're better than anybody because they haven't been able to acquire the things that we have. We are in positions to help others in our church, outside of our church, in our community. And we should do so. And in doing so, we're reflecting the love of God through our giving. We give to our church through tithes and offerings. We help, we serve. And then again, in our community, you know, these last few years have been tumultuous. People are going through. We know some of our neighbors may be elderly, maybe living on a fixed income, maybe a single mom with children. Help. We go grocery shopping, we can fill up our carts with groceries. How about getting some groceries for those neighbors? Helping in the community pantry. 
there's so much that we can do. So again, just think about it. What steps can we take to become less dependent on our possessions? It's not about that me, myself, and I. And as we go into the set of questions for parable number eight, which is regarding watchfulness, it says, what is it like to wait for someone without knowing when he or she is coming? Just think of it in terms of hours, days, weeks, or months. It says, have you ever been late to meeting someone for lunch? Have you ever forgotten about an appointment or forgotten to call someone after you said you would get back to them? It says, of course you have. We all have. It says, how do you think the other person felt? How do you feel when this happens to you? What if you expect to hear about a job application in a week and don't hear anything after two weeks? What if your taxes are being audited and you expect to hear something in two months and four months go by without hearing anything? It says, what if your son travels to Australia and he says, I'll call you when I get a chance. And after six months, you're still waiting to hear from him. So just think about how you feel waiting. So the second question asks, how were the servants to be while waiting for their master? As we read in Luke 12 chapter, the 35th and the 36th verses. How long did Jesus say the servants should be willing to wait for their master? How does this translate to us today? It says the servants were to be dressed Early translations say loins girded, meaning the loose outer garments gathered up for work or travel, not let loose for sleeping. It said lamps were to be burning. So when these two images, Jesus says, be prepared and be awake, even if many dull hours have passed and you're very tired. So how long to wait? Jesus really didn't say but implied the master might not come home until quite late. Now the third watch. Now it says night was divided into four watches by the Romans. It was 6 to 9 p.m., 9 p.m. to midnight, midnight to 3 a.m., and 3 to 6 a.m. So the Jews had only three watches during the night. Sunset to 10 p.m., 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., 2 a.m. to sunrise. So the parable probably referred to the last two of the Jewish watches. The wedding banquet would have begun in the first watch right after sunset. Today, are you waiting for the second coming? Are you prepared if it were to happen tonight? Are you ready? Most of us are not. Most of us would just like a little more time to be prepared. Most of us say, I need more time to read the Bible. I'm so busy with everything else, but maybe I'll have more time next week or next year or never. The word tells us to be ready because he's coming as a thief in the night. And do you ever know when a thief is coming? Do you prepare for the thief? No. So that's why we are to be ready for the second coming of our Lord and Savior. Third question asks, what happened to the servants who were watching properly in the 37th verse? It says, Jesus says, It will be good for those servants, that is the believers, whose master finds them watching when he comes. Then having said that, he deviates totally from the Middle Eastern culture. He says, I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. Now, in actuality, life back then, the master would come home to his house, knock on the door, and find the servants ready. They open the door, escort him in, hang up his coat, 
They show him to his favorite chair and then give him a hot drink. They say, do you want a bath? They've already warmed the water because remember back then there were no such things as hot showers. And now basically they greet him with an attitude of we are ready to serve you. But in the parable, we read the very opposite. In verse 37, when it says he will dress himself to serve, he does not refer to the servants. It's a singular word and it refers to the master. So here we have the master girding himself up and saying, I want you servants to recline at my table and I will serve you. So now this is a huge difference between a Middle Eastern Lord or master who would absolutely never do that. So in the story, who does the master represent? The master represents the Lord Jesus Christ. The wedding banquet that the master went to would seem to be a symbol of the enthronement of Jesus in heaven. And it points to his return for the final judgment for which he wants every believer, every one of us to be prepared. He wants us to sit at the table. He wants us to be ready. The fourth question, it says, for what are we to be watchful? What does watchfulness involve? Why is watchfulness not a passive activity? And then what are the three main messages of this parable? So this is a four-part question here. We must be watchful and ready for Jesus' return at any moment. No one knows the day nor the hour. It says Jesus' return is certain, but the time is not known. In Matthew 24, 36, it says, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So a specific outline of the future would actually be a hindrance, not a help to our faith. Certain signs are being given, but not for the purpose of making detailed predictions. Now, watchfulness is not passive or easy. As Luke warns in the 21st chapter, the 31st, uh, 34th verse, excuse me, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will come on you suddenly like a trap. So now the three messages here. First, the disciples and all believers must be ready for a return of Jesus at any moment. As verse 40 says, the son of man will come at an hour when we do not expect him. Secondly, you must allow for a delay that must neither reduce your expectancy nor impede your preparedness. As in verse 38, you must not let this delay discourage you so you fall into a trap or get overwhelmed by the drudgeries and anxieties of life. Thirdly, you must faithfully manage the resources that have been entrusted to you by God. Don't forget, we are stewards, caretakers, not owners. As the last parable emphasized, you can't take it with you. I'll leave you with this last question, another personal question. What responsibilities or duties might God demand of you? We ask ourselves, what can you do for God in your area of responsibility? Another thought-provoking question. Well, we praise God for this Bible study on tonight regarding the rich fool, and watchfulness. And next week, the Bible study will be on parables number nine, which is wise and foolish servants, and parable number 10, which is unfruitful victory. So we ask that you join us next Wednesday. And also you join us this Sunday 
morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school, taught by my husband, Deacon Dennis Blunt. And then stay tuned at 10 a.m. for a powerful word from our pastor, Gordon McKinney. Once again, I praise God for each and every one of you. We thank God for our pastor, Gordon McKinney, our lady, Veronina McKinney, and all the members of Greater Works Community Fellowship, Church of God in Christ. And I'm going to close with prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, humbly we come before you once again, oh God, on this evening, thanking you for this time and space, oh God, for a Bible study, oh God, regarding the parables of your son, Jesus. We're thanking you and praising you, oh God, for all the hearts and minds that have been touched, oh God, through this ministry, God, via social media. Oh God, we thank you, oh God, for how the lives have been enriched and will continue to be so, oh God. We're thanking you and praising you for the heart of our pastor and our first lady, oh God, to bring people the word. Oh God, we're asking that you continue to bless all of the hearers, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week.